morning, everybody, and welcome to Professional Beauty and Hairdressers Journal Ireland's webinar for this week. I always say that's a big mouthful when I say it. Um, and this week we are joined by Maura Healy, who is the owner of Alchemy Lab in Dublin. And just as we were talking there before uh, we started, if, did you say three months today since you opened? Yeah, it's my three month anniversary today. <laughs> three months. Congratulations. So you. yeah, you did that. Uh, you you managed to do that amazing thing of um, I think uh, before we would have always have said you know oh if somebody opened in the middle of a recession, um now you did the whole thing of you opened in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> which is very unusual. So uh, for anybody tuning in who doesn't know, um, Alchemy Lab is a lash and brow bar in the centre of Dublin. So you specialise specifically in that area, don't you? Yeah, we solely do lashes and brows. So everything to do with lashes and brows and nothing else. Okay, so today we decided we were going to focus on brows. Um, and you, I wanted you to just quickly maybe talk us through your own uh, career path and your, you know, brow journey, for the want of a better word, like why you eventually sort of settled on the brow area. Yeah, I guess um, I never really set out to do brows. I ended up, I was a makeup artist to start and I worked on makeup counters for years. And then I had my own festival business, which specialized in uh, festival makeup. And I did that as well, alongside working on makeup counters. And then I had a friend who was opening a makeup bar and our brow, sorry, brow bar. And she asked me would I come and work with her. And I decided to go for it. So she trained me in brows. And I never looked back. I absolutely loved brows from the moment I started doing it. And that's been 11 years now. Okay, so you're, you're well, well trained and uh, you, and do you, you know, do you equate, you know, the brows and do you, I think, because I think I, I read about your salon that you, you sort of specialize in the innovation and the creative side of it. Is that what, do you see it as something that's very creative? Yeah, I like obviously you have to have a certain amount of creativity within you to work and um, brow artistry. It, it is an art, but it is an art yeah. that you can learn. It's like somebody can learn how to draw, somebody can learn how to sketch, somebody can learn how to paint. So it's the same thing with brow art. But for me to really be good at brows, the passion has to be there. And that's where it all stems from is a passion for brows. And if you don't have that, then I don't think you'll ever get the art of brows. Okay, that's a good point. Um, so just moving on to uh, the trends that are out there at the moment, um, I suppose there's always sort of new things coming down the line and there's always a look that's going to be in that maybe wasn't in last year. So for you now that you've, you know, you're just opened in the last three months and you're, you've got people coming in, clients coming in all the time, um, what trends are most in demand these days? And I'm and I'm going to follow on with that. Maybe about maybe talk us through the different options that people go for, and maybe what you know what styles suit some people that might not suit other people, and what's high maintenance, what's low maintenance, all that sort of thing. Yeah. So I guess right now, um, you know, the the brow world is just constantly uh, evolving. It's I often wonder where is where a brow is going to be next year because there's so many dramatic changes on a year to year basis. But I guess right now the biggest trend is brow lamination or what mm -hmm. I call the brow lift. And it's absolutely huge. I mean, it's far overtaken just brow tints and tidies. Everybody's coming in for brow laminations and it is an absolutely beautiful lifted fuller finish to the brows. And so I would say that is the most um, on trend brow uh, style at the moment. But I guess microblading is still huge. Um, but, you know, you asked about the different styles and the different people, I guess for the younger generation, go for the brow lift. And then let's say people from their 30s, 40s, 50s onwards will be more interested in the microblading. And obviously that stems from the fact that, you know, in the 90s, a lot of us did damage to our brows. We tweezed mm. away our brows and these people need fixing. So I guess anybody like myself from your mid 30s onwards, they've done that damage to their brows. And there's no going back from it. So sort of mid thirties onwards will be my really popular, like the, my, my genre for people who are getting microblading. And then I guess from the teens onwards for brow lamination. 
but um, that would be sort of the trends that I see. But like, so like, it was always a case of brow tint and tidy. It was a really, really popular choice. But now people are realizing that actually, if I go for the brow lift, I get the brow tint, I get the brow tidy, but I also get this really wow brow finish. So it's sort of surpassing the brow tint and tidy in terms of popularity for me anyway. Okay, and um, and you find that you know that you get some people coming in that they're you know they're name checking like celebrities or influencers and they want yeah. exactly what they have. I think a few years ago there was a lot more of that. People were coming in with full albums of photos, going, "I want Kim Kardashian or Olivia Palermo's brows." But now actually a lot of it comes stems back to. I saw your Instagram page. I saw the work on your Instagram page. I want my brows like this on your Instagram page. So there's a lot of that rather than celebrity influence. And I think people are more educated these days to realize I don't have Kim Kardashian's brows. Therefore, I can't really achieve them if I have yeah. very little. So there's a sort of a sense, you know, a, real, a realistic check with themselves you know, to think oh, I can't have that. But let's say five years ago, people would come in with full albums of photos and you sort of have to talk them down and realize, you know, <laughs> we can't have this, but let's try and meet in the middle somewhere, you know? Yeah. Um, but like I do, one thing I have noticed recently since before pandemic and now during pandemic is that people have sort of toned back their look a bit. So people have gone a little bit more natural in the sense that lash extensions aren't as popular well, not with it, with us, but things like Yumi Lashes, which is a lash firm, which is more natural and mm. it, it's easier to maintain. That is like through the roof in terms of pop, um, popularity. So there's little things like that that I have noticed that people are just a, a little softer with their look. They're more natural with their look. Yeah. And they're not afraid of, you know, leaving, you know, six or eight weeks between appointments and like letting that natural look come back in a little bit, which is nice to see. Yeah, and do you think that's probably probably is because you know when we were <laughs> we all went into shock when we couldn't get to the salon, <laughs> so it was yeah. like people sort of had to work a little bit more with what they naturally had before they got like back into the salon, and then they maybe decided that that look was something that they wanted to keep keep up. Completely, I even think with people with their hair now, they're pushing their hair appointments out you know, and maybe their weekly blow dry isn't as important to them as it once was. And just little things like that, I feel that people have embraced a more natural side to themselves. And I, but I also yeah. do think that the salon itself, I think because I promote myself as more of a natural beauty salon, that I have clients that come in, I'm not pushing a hard look. And I guess there's clients out there who want a really done look and they'll go to those salons that are advertising on their Instagram, the winged eyelashes or the really heavy brow. Yeah. And they'll come to me because they're like, oh, you know, a lot of my clients say, oh, I love how natural your approach to beauty is. So we get a lot of that. Yeah, so I suppose the other different markets for, for different salons. And just around the, you know, the different, you know, treatments there that you mentioned, you know, how do you manage your time and your client list to make sure obviously because you know you're a new business and you want to stay profitable but you know are some tr of those treatments that you you talked about like lamination versus microblading are some of them more time consuming and like how do you manage all that to keep you know balancing your demand with doing a really good job and as you said making it like almost like your art but then making sure that you're busy and profitable at the same time yeah, I guess firstly, the most important thing is to know your worth. And that's hugely important. Um, you know, not underpricing yourself because you're afraid I'm a new business and I'm trying to get my name out there. I know I'm really good at what I do. I know my worth. And you have to sort of pitch yourself competitively against the local businesses um, around you that are doing the same thing. But I guess for me, I have um, a certain amount that I know I need to bring in on an hourly basis. And I sort of pitch that against my treatments. And sometimes I'm just making that amount and sometimes it's going over, but it depends on, you know, some treatments are so specialized, like microblading, which I have pumped in. At this stage, I've probably pumped in 10,000 euro into training for microblading. So, you know, you have yeah. to pit that against what you're pricing, you know, your, your time, your expertise, and um, your training. And just, uh, yeah, my biggest thing is not to undersell yourself. That, that's huge and I see a lot of people out there and they're doing it and 
nobody wants to be a busy fool you know so I, I'm very conscious yeah. of that and, and I do think that the treatments I offer the prices I offer I am love bombing everybody who comes in and they are getting a premium service so I do feel that you know I have to everything that I do and um, has a value and there's a reason that it is that, that amount you know yeah and I guess that that's probably true across the board you know um, I think um, clients cop that on after a while as well, that like if something is being advertised as really cheap, there's a reason. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's not going to be done right or the right products aren't going to be used. Like I'm thinking even more specifically there around um, manicures, you know, um, you know, the way some places might advertise falsely, you know, that they're doing like shellac, but it's not real shellac. Exactly. And, you know, and it's only 15 euro and then, you know, you fall for it and then you wonder afterwards, you know, are you realized afterwards? That's why it was 15 euro and not 35 euro, you know, exactly. which ultimately is money better spent. Yeah. And you get more out of your treatment. Like so many people walk away and they're like, oh, my God, this lasted so long. I've never had this last so long before for me like, it, like for example tinting like people are like oh, your tints last two or three weeks longer and that's because everything I use is a premium product so you know I guess if I was using cheaper products and I was maybe more suburban my prices could be lower or just if I didn't have but because of location products everything you have to you have to do your, your budgets and make sure that you know you're not wasting your time essentially yeah and I think you had said to me um, previously um, that, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit is, is something almost that's in your, your genes, is it? Yeah, my, all my family, almost all my family have their own businesses. So um, definitely from a family of grafters and hard yeah. And it's just... And was that, would, would, would that have been something that you always knew that you would ultimately do, like at some point? point in time you would run your own business yeah a hundred percent like it's kind of second nature in my family to open your own business and yeah it was always something but I was I was very much so a free spirit I was traveling the world for a long time and I was um, working and you know I just I wasn't ready for it and now I'm ready even though it is in the middle yeah. of a pandemic um, I was never ready before, but I knew the time would come for me to have my own business. I just never thought I'd do it in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, yeah, we, we, none of us knew it was coming anyway. So we're all sort of like figuring it out as we go along. Exactly. Um, and then just um, in terms of, you know, like uh, what I was saying to you earlier on, like you specifically offer, you know, the brow and the lash service, but is that an area which is, you know there's good opportunities for upselling so are you doing retail as well and um, at the moment i am only i'm actually not doing brow retail because i'm looking for the perfect product so i haven't okay. found all my products that i use in the studio are vegan and i just haven't found a product that i think is quality enough to stock um, and it's actually quite difficult to find a really high standard um brow products so I've been looking and I just don't want to stock something until I find a product that's perfect for me um yeah but I do stock some products that are based around lash care brow care but just not actually the makeup side of things just yet um but as as you were saying offering brows as a service I think any salon that doesn't offer brows as a service is is missing out because it's so huge it's so popular um, even if you have one person in your salon that um, has that enthusiasm for, um, for brows, I would really put my energy into training that person and um, feeding their passion for brows because it could be such a huge entity in your, within your business to make money if you're doing it well. Okay, um, that sort of leads on to what I was going to ask you there about like, is, is um, having a brow offering is it one of the good ones to have um, for, you know, boosting like that client loyalty and getting repeat customers? Like, is it one of those areas where like, if a client comes and finds, you know, the right person to do their brows, that they will keep coming back as opposed to shopping around? Absolutely. I think um, a brow artist is like a good hairdresser. 
in the sense that once you find them and you have develop a good relationship with them, you don't leave them. Um, and also it's sort of like, you know, hair color in the sense that once you get your brows done, you have to keep coming back every four to six to eight weeks. So there is that uh, recurring business um, there and it's huge for the taking, you know, and let's say you have a salon, but you're not that interested in brows. But as I said, you have one person who's interested. I would put my attention on focusing, you know, putting that person into training because it can lead on to other things that person can eventually go on to learn microblading and that's a huge revenue, you know? So there's so much potential to grow um, your business within the brow industry and also, you know, just bring in a lot of extra revenue that you didn't even realize was there for the taking. And um, also if you're having people coming in for their nails, nails and brows go so well together. I always think there's three things that are hugely popular and that's hair, nails and brows. And if you had nails and brows in your salon, it's, it's massive. So Yeah. Okay. And then just um, on the whole, I know it's such a big area, the marketing side of things. Um, I, I, I'm guessing at the moment you're doing it all yourself. And like, how did you start, like, say, from, you know, from scratch, like, you know, I suppose that you, you had a name for yourself because you worked in, in the industry anyway, but like starting with your own business from scratch, did you put um, a budget into marketing or did you do it all from the ground up? Like, can you talk us through that? Um, okay, so I did. I realized that I needed to invest in marketing um, to, you know, to grow my business. Now, it, I only had a small budget, but I decided that I was going to focus my attention on Instagram. And because I really believe that Instagram, especially because I'm on the second floor, uh, I'm not on street level. So I really wanted to make Instagram my high street shop front. And mm -hmm. I decided that I was going to invest my money and have a social media coach, I guess, to help me. And I had a friend um, who is helping me just basically plan my months, plan my social media, and it's just worked so efficiently. I mean, I probably get 50% of the people who come in the door to me now are through social media. So that's absolutely huge. Um, I decided as well very early on after investigating some pure options that pure was just way out of my price bracket. I mean, the first quote I got for just the first three months of pure was 3,000 euro. And as a small business starting off, I was just like, no. not realistic I'm gonna do the hard work and I just made this I gave myself a budget and I decided to um get my friend involved to help me and he's helping me and like I mean it's it's a lot of work and uh, we work really hard together to make uh, things happen on the Instagram and the Facebook page but it's paying off and as I said probably 50% of the people who walk in the door are from Instagram Okay, so that's that works. And do you think actually um, it's something that I've heard people say before, you know, that when when you're deciding on your social media, you know, I suppose strategic plan or marketing plan or whatever, that it's better to pick one one or two of because there's so many platforms, but like if you that you can't spread yourself across all of them because then you'll just fall through the cracks. So it's better to pick, like, did you go for Instagram because it's so visual? Like, what was the decision making there? Yeah, well, obviously it's so visual, but it's now the tool. Like when people are looking there, you know, people come into me and they say, oh, Maura, I looked up microblading Dublin and I found you via hashtag. And just, I guess so many people, I got so much support from people when I started and so many people shared and my page on their stories at the start. I mean, I got nearly 2,000 followers in the past three months just by pushing and sharing and, you know, interacting with my clients. So it is that sense that, I mean, I, I, I've made friends with so many people on Instagram that end up coming into me and it is a lot of work. And I do get grief from my friends and my family for having my head in my phone the whole time at the moment. But for me, that's a short term thing for a, a you know, long term payoff. But um, yeah, I, I don't plan on completely absorbing myself in my phone for the next year. But I think for the first six months, that's my plan. Yeah. And, and, it, and it does pay off. It is hard work. Yeah.
yeah but it's a, yeah, yeah i suppose it has to be done um you'd wonder like how people coped in the olden days when there was no, no such thing as social media you know well i suppose they just worked with what they had yeah yeah and then i wanted to chat to you a little bit about um you teamed up with uh dress for success um can you maybe talk me through that and explain about that charity yeah so dress for success is a women's charity, it's a global charity, but every uh, country has its own version of it. So we have Dress for Success Dublin, Dress for Success Cork, and um, it's basically a charity that helps women that have sort of uh, either uh, women who are living in direct provision centers or women who have just kind of fallen on hard times and you know, the doctor might refer them on. And what it is, it's a, a charity that helps rebuild women's confidence um, and it's not just about dressing. Actually, they've spoken about changing the name for Dress for Success because it's so much more than just about dressing them. It's about everything, yeah. building up their confidence, preparing them for interviews. You know, some people, it could be a case of they've lost a child and they're completely grief stricken. And they're, they're just, because of that, their whole life has fallen apart. They've in a really financially unstable situation. And, um, you know, they just really need to rebuild their lives from the ground up. Um, we just did an event recently with 50 women who had been sex trafficked and, you know, they've been, they're living in direct provision centers, which is still a horrendous situation for them, but they've been put through courses and they were graduating and, you know, we're here to help with them in terms of appearance, boosting their confidence and giving them the confidence they need to get back out into the world and flourish, basically. But um, okay. that's what the charity is about, yeah. Yeah, so you, um, I know you said that like you've, you've kind of almost pegged them as, as the charity that you'd like to be involved with before you even opened your doors. But, you know, is that something that is quite important to you as a, a business person now with your own business that, you know, you do have some sort of giving back angle to the business? And, and I mean, I know that it's all about like, of course, it's all about the charity and about giving back, but do you think that's very good for a business model as well? Well, yeah, I think it's hugely important for businesses to get involved in giving back, but also just on a personal level for me, I'm really passionate about giving back. Um, I just feel I've had a lot of fortune in my life and I feel like even to be able to open this business in a pandemic has been hugely fortunate for me. And for me, just it's a, it's a passion for me to give back and to help people. So charity work um, was always like top of the list of things that I wanted to do within my business model. Uh, but I also think that collectively, if everybody was to do something to give back um, within businesses, then you know, it would just make such a massive difference. And yeah, and it does look good for your business to be giving back on top of everything else. That's probably the lowest down the, the line for me but as yeah. a business it does look good but most importantly um for me it's just about actually doing good and it's probably selfish it's a feel-good factor for me yeah but i mean it's it's um as you said it's it's good for business as well because i suppose when you think about it if you've got like two salons you know side by side you know and they've got the same prices and the same level of service or whatever and one of them is you know connected to some charity and they're doing some sort of initiative and the other one isn't as human beings we'll probably always be drawn towards the one that's doing that little bit extra yeah the empathy within probably, us yeah. yeah exactly yeah yeah so um and i know you said to me before that at the moment you are flying solo so you're running the whole place yourself and you're it's just you and the, the salon doing all the 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 eyes <laughs> yeah yeah so um <clears throat> the plan was to have more people working with me but just with the economy the way it is and it's just too it's fluctuating too much so me working with just by myself it means I'm constantly busy and I'm not stressing about employees and are they sitting there for four hours without work you know so i just think right now until we have more certainty within the industry i'm just going to keep it as myself um yeah. you know it's it's just it's just too uncertain right now 
yeah. And I suppose something that I meant to say to you at the beginning as well was um, what we were saying before we went on air, um, that like, in a way, uh, if you're going to pick any business to, to be in at the moment, um, you know, in the beauty industry, like the eyes, because, you know, we were saying that like with the masks now, people really want to highlight. Have people said that to you coming in? Yeah, constantly, <laughs> constantly. They're like, that's all I can see. I, all I can see is my brows now. So, you know, that definitely has been a massive boost for business. I feel, yeah, another little lucky strike beside me is that I decided to, I, my plan would have always been to open a lash and brow bar. But uh, yeah, I guess another lucky thing that happened is that, you know, that's all people are seeing now are the brows and lashes. And uh, so that's definitely, uh, it was good timing for the business. Good timing, yeah, yeah. Um, so before we let you go, I wanted to ask you uh, that lovely question of, as an entrepreneur, what's been the best and the worst thing about opening a business in a pandemic? Uh, the best thing about it was, um, well, there's been actually a lot of positive points. Uh, firstly, the level of support that like poured out for me. I mean, people I didn't even know on Instagram and Facebook were sharing my page just to support me because people were like, yes, you know, I think people are just happy to see people opening businesses and trying at the moment. I guess it's a good news story, isn't it? So that was yeah. massive, you know, and like, and then there were certain things like, um, let's say my chairs that I bought for the studio, as you can see, I got three gorgeous chairs and I bought those from a Lash and Brow studio that were closing down. So I got them for, you know, a seal. Uh, I, like, there were, a lot of things went into sale. My tattoo machine, I got for half price from the company right. that I bought it from because it was during a pandemic sale. Um, and a lot of things like that really worked in my favor uh, in terms of opening in a pandemic. And I guess, um, yeah, yeah, like there's a lot of enthusiasm out there. Some businesses locally closed. So I got the overflow of their clients. Um, you know, and also people, I think as well, after being locked down for so long, they were looking to try something new as well. So there, yeah. there was a lot of different angles why opening in the middle of a pandemic worked in my favor. Um, and obviously people were really keen to get treatments as well once the salons reopened. So yeah. And then the downside to opening a, in a pandemic, I guess is all the uncertainty. I yeah. don't really let the stress of, you know, the other day on, on, on Monday, all I had was messages from other brow artists absolutely freaking out. And I guess I yeah. just have a very positive demeanor. And I was just, I, what will be will be in my, in my opinion. And we just have to, to ride with it. And right now my opinion is just work really, really hard, as many hours as I can, spend very little money. And then hopefully if we do go into lockdown again, then, you know, it won't be so stressful because I put, I've, I've laid those roots down, but um, I guess there is that uncertainty for sure. That's the worst thing about being in this current economy, this current yeah. climate. It's just the uncertainty. Um, but yeah, that, that's just the biggest thing. I, I guess yeah. as well, you know, having to be so conscious with masks and um, with, you know, just being that extra bit paranoid constantly. And it's, you know, for, for myself, for clients, and um, I don't want to get sick. If I even get a cough or a sore throat, I'm going to have to close the business completely while I get COVID tested and, you know, let clients know. So there's all those elements that you have. And I'm just trying to do things like stay, stay fit and healthy, get good sleep, have a good diet, take loads of vitamins, you know? So there's all these little things that you'd never have thought about before. And um, yeah. you know, with a business that now I'm very conscious of. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, you're, you're right there when he said that uh, the uncertainty, like, I guess, something that we're all trying to live with at the moment. And, um, and it's not nice, but it's like, you know, we don't really have an option at this point, <laughs> only to roll with it. And that's the thing. It's just, um, you know, people getting wound up about things that, that are out of their control. It's just damaging for your health. You know, stress is the biggest link to sickness. So I, I know yeah. it's, it's really hard. I mean, I'm lucky. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have children. So my stress and worries are not the same. My, my biggest stress is closing the business. So I guess when other people with other bigger problems, it's easier for me to say, oh, don't worry, don't stress, try and live day to day. 
but you know that's easy for me to say but I guess there yeah, are I things know. like just being very conscious of your wellness for me meditation and um, breathful breath uh, classes things like that they play a big part in my week so I just try to stay calm and stay balanced that way and I guess that might not be for everybody you have to find the thing that's right for you whether it's getting up getting out going for a big walk doing something that makes takes the stress off you but it's so important to make that time for yourself yeah okay thank you so much for joining us um it was really lovely to um you know to chat about brows and to also chat about just you know the fact that you've opened a new business which is just amazing in the middle of a pandemic and we can see it there in the background on screen it looks gorgeous and it looks really welcoming and as we said the lovely view out the window so obviously we wish you every bit of luck with it and you know fingers crossed that there are no hiccups but you know even if there are hiccups and I mean you know the COVID hiccups you know that you'll you, you know we'll all be okay and that you'll just have to close for a little while only to reopen again to, to better days so oh, um thank you yeah, sorry, just one thing I was going to say is one thing I have said to people is just to remember within our industry, if if we do close again, those people aren't going anywhere. We're just going to get a mad Christmas rush again when the studios where salons reopen. So the revenue will come back in in one form or another, unless, of course, people are going to people's houses. But I generally feel that the people who come to that salon environment don't skip off to people's houses to get treatments done in the middle of a lockdown. But I do feel that you might be temporarily paused, but that revenue will come back in in a crazy rush again. Yeah, I suppose it's a bit like, that's a very good way of looking at it because like when, when the industry was closed for the 15 weeks and it reopened on the 29th of June, you know, most salons were opened round the clock. They were doing crazy shifts and eventually they got through the backlog and you know, start to balance out a little bit again. Maybe we're a little bit quieter, but like as you said, if there's another lockdown, you know, people in the industry should just look upon it as a little bit of a break <laughs> before yeah. they have the next, because Christmas is always a mad rush anyway for that industry. So you know, it could be doubly that. So that that actually is a really hopeful and uh, positive way of looking at it. Yeah, we might just get three Christmas rushes this year. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Like we're all living this whole new way, these yeah. ups and downs, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So Lily, thank you again for joining us, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. And um, in the meantime, best of luck. And thank you everybody for tuning in. And we will be back again. Uh, keep an eye on our social for the details of next week's webinar. It will be coming through from Hairdressers Journal in the UK. So until then, bye everyone. Thanks, Maura. Thanks so much.